And we are live on Twitch. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Bonus Pod, the companion podcast to the MinMax show. My name is Haley McLean. I'm the community manager of MinMax, and today I'm joined by Jacob Geller. Hello. Hi, Jacob. We were eating this week. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of games getting shoved at our faces for hours straight, and then we got a juicy new DLC we're going to chat about. Are you overwhelmed? Do you feel tired today? I, 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 I think I don't feel as tired because I have the, uh, you know, I watched Summer Game Fest with everyone live on stream, and then, you know, I kind of fast forwarded through the Xbox one. I like the ones that I have not been live on. I also have not been keeping up with, and Fair. so I have just kind of let myself off the hook for it. But um, that means that uh, you might have more to talk about with this. I mean. I've been watching trailers. Don't worry. But I'm not feeling completely overwhelmed. Everything always kind of ends up on our Twitter feed anyways, right? Like, it finds its way yeah. to us. But it is nice when it's all condensed in one crazy spurt of game at once. But I'm not going to lie. At the end, of, like, when we did the Summer Games Fest and then the Day of the Dead's right after, I was like, oh, my God. Like, so, like it's so stupid to complain. But, like, that was so hard to remember all those games because... So many of them look cool, especially after the Wholesome Direct, too. When I watched that, I was like, I'm so overwhelmed in the best way, but I also, like, how do I keep up with this? Because I wanted to play 85% of the games I just saw, and I knew I wouldn't be able to. Yeah. The indie scene, especially. Um, the indie scene, especially. I mean, one of mine, uh, my the, the game that I'm hottest on out of Summer Game Fest is also the one that are, like, you know, I don't know. This whole is it all summer game fest? Th this thing that we're doing, <laughs> yeah, um, is also one of the only ones that uh, that you can play right now, as far as you know. Where um, uh, should should we just should we just jump into this? I don't know if we're oh. gonna do like a top five or just start like. Let's start with the DLC because you know, yelling I, them out. I, do you want or do okay. you want to do that? Which one do you prefer? Well, I guess the DLC people might want to click off for so maybe let's do Ooh. our stuff that we're excited first and then we can do like spoilery stuff later sounds good we did have one question can you play night springs dlc before playing alan wake 2 like anything remedy you can but you will enjoy it a thousand times more if you go and play every single other yeah game like ever that, what what would be the point of you know they also don't explain like the mechanics of either yeah. the game or like the world so it's like sure but but i don't I, I don't think you would like there's any reason to the dlc is like a super yummy side to the main meal that is alan wake 2 and you will if you're considering playing night springs you'll just love playing alan wake 2 as well so i feel like yeah. you'll i would just go do that you don't even have to play alan wake 1 you don't have to be a freak and play everything but it is. So maybe you should play. <sighs> maybe you should. Quantum Break. We'll, I, we'll talk about oh, it. We'll talk about it. But after the third episode, I want to play. Now, that's really put a spur in me to play Quantum Break finally because I want to know more yeah. about what was going on there. But yeah, sure. Let's dive into. That's a really good point that some people might not want to hear. Too, not that we'll completely spoil everything about it, but we're going to be talking about it. So. Or should we just um, do. I don't know. We could do a max spoilers on it, super fast style. We'll decide decide later yeah um anyway here is what i am super excited about uh and most most of all coming out of the past few days because it's one of the only things that you can play right now is the game i am your beast uh there is a demo of that is available have you heard of this thing Haley? no i hadn't heard of it and you played so the this demo is, yes uh this is the new game uh, by Strange Scaffold, who is uh, notably the El Paso Elsewhere uh, team. Okay. Um, and it's it's got. I'm thinking of them because he is such a prominent voice as the. Um, uh, gosh, I'm realizing I actually don't know how to pronounce his name, but um, Zalavier Nelson Jr., um, who's like the the voice of of um, El Paso Elsewhere, as well as being like the the game's director and whatever. Okay. But I am your beast is basically like it, it, it it's like a neon white ass game in the best way that i could possibly communicate where it's like a game where you're supposed to speed run and you're just going through levels full of enemies but 
throwing your gun at enemies is just as good, if not better, than, like, shooting them with it. Yeah. And the levels are really cool, and the art style is really great. And there are, like, five levels that you can play right now, and yesterday I downloaded it, and I just played it for, like, an hour and a half. I'm so psyched about this thing. It's really giving 3D Hotline Miami. Like, even the UI with showing how the X is over the kill, like, when you get a kill and yeah, stuff yeah, I'm yeah. looking at. Yeah, it has this really satisfying thing where when you headshot someone, or kill them at all, but usually it's a headshot, it's like their their face just gets X'd out on screen. <laughs> I um, like that. It was, I mean, it's like, I, I tweeted this, but it's like, if I'm trying to get S ranks in a demo, I am in. <laughs> because usually I think of a demo as something that's just going to, like, vanish from the earth, and so I don't, like, put a lot of time Nothing into will it. transfer over, like, who cares? Yeah, exactly. And I don't know if this will or not. I mean, clearly it's just, you know, it's just kind of the beginning of the game. Um, but it is just, like, I don't know what makes what makes a, a shooting game like this fun and other shooting games not, but like, it's just got some alchemy going on that I am like so plugged into. And it's not a game that you just have to watch a trailer for. You can, you know, you can play it. And so I think that's why it's kind of at the top of my list right now. Nice. Uh, not weeder in the chat says you sparked a chain of speed run vids on Twitter. I, <laughs> yeah. So I tweeted myself getting an S rank in a video and then the developers Olavier uh tweeted uh he said I'm putting out a bounty on Jacob Geller which is a very <laughs> funny thing to tweet and then he was like if anyone if anyone beats his S rank time I'll like send you a steam gift code and like I wasn't even I didn't even have a particularly good S rank time you know I I was just like doing it yeah um but yeah people I, I like I did it in Mine was like twenty two seconds, I think, and and Ooh, it people can be were that short, in, eh? Yeah, yeah, and people were doing it in like seventeen. Wow. Uh, so it was like they fully cut like twenty percent of my time off, if not more. It was really, it was really cool, and it was uh, very <laughs> flattering for him to be like, "All right, I'm gonna, I'm putting out a bounty on Jacob Geller." What a smart marketing thing to latch onto. A tweet he's, like that. I mean, he's so good, Haley. I don't know if you've seen like his TikToks. Uh, he he is a really good communicator, and that it like it feels genuine, and it feels like he's just talking about game development. But they are like they're very funny, and they get you excited about his games. I've been like really impressed with with his voice as kind of like a dev but also pr person nice that's cool so that's coming out august 15th 2024 so recently too or soon yeah I this mean, game well. or this year yeah a lot of stuff honestly i was surprised by how many things were tw had 2024 release dates me um, too one that stuck out to me was from the wholesome direct um or no it might have been day of the dev sorry now I'm, they all blur together but pedal runner it's this pixelated very Game Boy, like, looks like Pokemon, like, Radical Red, if it had Oh, yeah, this one, like, insane... really looked like Pokemon. Yeah, right? like, just a really gorgeous art style. The way that the mechanics are working, like, it looks like the way Pokemon works. And what's really cute about this one is it had a really cool premise, too. It's, like, you're delivering pets to people, but they're, like, digital pets, and you get, you, like, code them and get them organized. It looks like they come in little Tamagotchis, and you deliver those to the people. And there's mini games to get them all ready. And I guess you're, the little guy who comes along with you is, like, a first-generation obsolete one. So you, like, he just is like, I'm a Gen 1 little pal, and he just is, runs around with you. It looks so charming. And just the visuals of it. I was on board two seconds into the trailer. I was like, yep. Love yeah, it. it really, this is one of those where, like, it had kind of, like, a lavish animated trailer, and I was like, okay, and then when it started showing the gameplay, I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it's like, sometimes you don't know, you don't know what the game is going to be when, when you get that kind of, like, fancy animated trailer, but, like, yeah, the use of, like, the understanding of the limited color palette of the mm. Game Boy and stuff is just so well done here. The purples and the pinks and the blue. It's just like comp like the people who make this have the color wheel posted in every corner of their office and no co color theory. You know what I mean? I just yeah, exactly. tell looking at it how good it is. It was funny. Blake messaged me and was like, oh, we're collecting like um, 
we're collecting uh, quotes for games or whatever, and this one's on the list I just saw, and it was me talking about during our mid-max stream, and I said something to the effect of, like, oh, this looks so good, my eyes are chomping it, which I don't even remember <laughs> saying, but I guess that'll be listed somewhere on a trailer or something, maybe, They're going to put that fun. on the box, yeah. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> they totally have my consent to do that right now. But, that's yeah, awesome. I just saw it, and I was, you know when things just click, and you're like, that's for my brain. I was like, I love that. I'm going to play that. Yeah. Excited for it. What's another one for you? Um, okay, well, there there was one that I was medium interested in until i realized uh the the team behind it and that is oh. wander stop which is it is a game where you are working at a tea shop and you're doing little farming and harvesting and your character is kind of talking and it seems like oh she was previously like a warrior and now she's trying to do tea and at the end it had this kind of looked like a sort of anxiety attack oh yeah moment. yeah and in the moment, I thought, okay, that looks interesting. Um, and then I realized that it was made uh, by by Davey Reedon, uh, who is the maker of The Beginner's Guide, which is my favorite game of all time. Oh, my God. And there you so, go. <laughs> you know, this is also for people who probably know uh, more more well-known than The Beginner's Guide is The Stanley Parable. He's the guy who made The Stanley Parable. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I, I really love his second game. But, like... He is, you know, I, I like the beginner's guide so much that he has a a lifetime buy-in from me, where it's just like literally anything he makes in any genre with any pitch, I'm like, I'm there, baby. You know, I, I want to see your creative vision with this thing. And so, like, even though the the pitch seemed a little superficial from the trailer maybe which is just kind of like oh it's like a cozy game but there's a core of anxiety yeah which is actually a thing that we see with like a lot of cozy games you know a lot of cozy games are actually about anxiety or depression or something um i i just like i have such respect for his previous work that i'm uh i am really really excited for it i don't know if it has a release date it just says Not coming yet. soon on steam yeah yeah but no, that one looked really cool. It like yeah, it's interesting. When I heard that it was the Stanley, I haven't played Beginner's Guide, but I've obviously played Stanley Parable. And here, even hearing that it's behind him, I was like, oh, I'm immediately curious to what this is because I kind of when I first looked at it, I was like, tea shop, cozy, looks cute, love the art style. Even with the like pseudo anxiety attack thing happening, I was like, that's an interesting twist. But hearing that it's from that dude makes me go, okay, what else though? Like, I automatically think something else is going to be going on. Right, and it's you know, to I, Haley, you should you should play the beginner's guide. It's very yeah. good. It's not very long. Um, but like the Stanley Parable is this really interesting like hey, let's make a game that's, like, deconstructing the idea of a game in, like, a really clever and fun way. And the Beginner's Guide is like, let's make a game that is uh, one of the most profound statements on what it means to talk about art that I've ever seen. <laughs> and, and, like, that that jump from those two. And so it's like, yeah, whatever. And it's been, it's been a long time since the Beginner's Guide came out. And I know that um, Stanley Parable Ultra Deluxe recently released, yeah. without spoiling it, there's a lot of new stuff in that game. Um, but, like, it has been a long time since kind of a proper new game from Davey Reedon. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm I'm psyched. Cool. That's exciting. Uh, my next one is... I was really psyched to see Life is Strange Double Exposure in the Xbox yeah. thing. And they're bringing back Max Clawfield, who is the protagonist in the first one, which is... A lot of people's favorite one, which is it's just the very first one hits so different because I remember at that time it was such a breath of fresh air to have this. Oh, I see now. Hello? <laughs> oh, what's happening? Hi, Ben. Hello? Hello? Coming to you live from Summer Game Fest 2024. Oh, my God. Ah, a surprise? We're <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all eating. Charles Hart is here, but his mouth is filled with burrito. <laughs> Hi, Charles Hart. Can Did you, you hear me? my crunch? Yes. I can hear your mouthful mumbling. Yes. <laughs> Janet's here. Hello. Hi, Janet. And we have Jeff Keeley's background music here as well. Hello. Oh, I thought you were just going to say, and we have Jeff Keeley. I was like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, he is wandering around everywhere. It's it's like, it's a fabled sighting. It's like if Sasquatch was just like hanging out in your backyard. You saw him over. <laughs> wow. 
<laughs> it's wonderful. Wait, is he not? Why did I buy all those magnets in Seattle if that's not true? Oh, my God. How are the reaction streams going? Really good. They've Honestly, they've been very – we loved the Xbox one yesterday. I was super blown away by that one. But not fun? Yeah, Jacob, how are you enjoying the show so far? It, it's been – it's been surprisingly good. You know, everyone kept saying, hey, not a big year. Don't get excited. And then maybe yeah. they undersold it enough that I'm allowed to get excited. <laughs> Jacob, do you want me to go stare at Phantom Blade Zero or some Jacob-ass game for a while here? Can you can you find, we were just talking about, can you find if Davey Reedon is there and ask him about Wanderstop, please? That's all I want to do, and he is not here. Damn I, wish. I truly wish he was here. Um, but then again, I think there's secret stuff behind closed doors that we're not privy to. So maybe it's just his luxurious temple that we can't quite access. <laughs> mm, what a luxury. Uh, what a luxury. yeah. And, and the other case, yeah, go, go stare at some game with a sword where you can do a backflip. That sounds good. <laughs> okay. Can do. We'll talk more about SGF on the main podcast this week, but, uh, I don't know, Charles, anything you want to say to bonus pod? Keep on maxing. That's our phrase. We will, <laughs> Charles. Right. Great. All right. Love you, too. We'll uh, fix the layout by hanging up now. <laughs> Don't worry. It didn't even bye. get affected. Bye. Okay, bye. I love that he still is worried about layouts and stuff. Like, he knows that calling in would affect the boxes of the layout. <laughs> that of is course. what he would worry about <laughs> calling in. Uh, I meant to ask uh, okay. him if uh, he if he screamed when he saw that Age of Empires update. Whoops, we'll guess we'll get to that on the Min Max show. Because there was also there was the point in the Summer Game Fest presentation where we all thought we heard him laugh. I can't yeah. remember exactly what it was, but it really sounded like there was a Hanson ass like <laughs> ha out in the ha! audience. He even texts yeah. that. Have you noticed that he'll go ha comma yeah blah blah blah. And I always I'm like, like I bet he would say that in real life if he was saying that sentence. Well, uh, okay, you were talking about Life is Strange. <laughs> I was talking about Life is Strange and then Ben appeared. Um, I love the first one. I've replayed it quite a few times. It's just like such a comfy, nostalgic game for me at this point. I'm trying to remember when the first one even came out. Was it 20, like 11 or something? I was in... It was forever ago. Yeah, I'm trying to remember if I played it. 2015, even later. Oh, okay. So I did play it in college. But yeah, I because I, one of the interesting things... Well, I also wonder if that's when the last episode came out. Because oh, it yeah. was released episodically. And I think there was actually a pretty big gap between episodes as it was being released. It was one in that kind of weird... I think uh, you're right. Let me see. That His... weird time in the gaming space. They... Um, Looks like they all came out periodically throughout 2015. No, oh, okay. Well, maybe yeah. maybe I'm wrong then. Um, but uh, yeah, the the interesting thing with Life is Strange has always been that people are way more connected to that first game mm -hmm. than any of the others, you know. And That's so it's true. like they made Life is Strange two, which was really a departure, and and you know was about like brothers, and notably did not have queer women in it, and I feel like it really <laughs> didn't hit because the audience it seems to really be interested in queer women, and then the True Colors, uh, I thought was great and had I think a more similar story to Life is Strange one, it did yeah, uh, than some of the other ones, but yeah they uh, they're bringing Max back, and I uh, I really like her updated look. Me I too. think it's cool that she's like older, and you can tell she's older, but you can also still tell that she's Max. Yeah, it's kind of like, it reminds me of how Telltale updates their models. Like, you could still know it's Clementine, but then if you see a screenshot of Clementine Season 1 and Clementine Season 5 or whatever, how, like, you're like, oh my god, it looks so different, but there's still a thread line there. Yeah, and, and also just, like, the it's weird to talk about the tech with that kind of game, but, like, they really have gotten a hold on like the lighting and kind of the expressiveness of the characters even within that like pretty simple art style where like i was i mean i was impressed by a lot of what true colors was doing and like watching mm -hmm. this trailer i was like oh this looks good mm -hmm. like the they really have figured out the looks of these games i'm also excited to see going back to those specific characters because i like them so much um I think they've grown a bit in their writing. Like the, the, the meme is always like how many times Chloe says hella in that first game. And you're just like internally cringing the entire time. And you're like, that's right. The guy, 
the guy who spoilers kills her in the first five minutes says, uh, I don't owe you shit. And Chloe says, wrong, you owe me hella cash. And I think about that line once a week. Because, like, I like Chloe. I Like, I get her character. She's very annoying sometimes with her. It's more of the way yeah. she's written than what she does or who she is. They, they really just sometimes... Yeah, it's the hella thing. There's a bunch of other stuff she says. I really like Max. I really like Max's voice actress. I think she's really good. She's one of my personal fave game voice actresses. So hearing her... What else has she... I don't know. I just know her from Max, but... Hearing her oh, voice, yeah, but she is really good. <laughs> yeah, hearing her voice come up in that trailer, like two seconds in, I was like, "That's Max Schofield. This is Life is Strange." Oh my god, she's a singer too. Apparently, Chad says she's only ever voiced Max ever. Oh my gosh! But she was just really because um, so much of that game was just her internal monologue thoughts, which can, unless you're good at that, it can really bring a game down if it's not hitting. And a lot of the tone she kind of held on her back, sort of like. Um, freaking like hellblade like if if the voice acting in hellblade yeah. wasn't good that game would suck a lot more because so much of it is just listening to the thoughts no and it's i i have always been kind of entertained by life is strange which is quietly one of the most polarizing games ever released <laughs> i think where people like i i really like life is strange that sounds like you really like life is strange mm-hmm no one is, like, mid on it. Like, if they hate it, mm. they are like, that is the worst written game ever made. And, like, sometimes it's hard to disagree with them, but I still, like, you know, I'm like, no, but that's part of it. That's part of why I like it is, yeah. is these kind of weird, awkward lines. But I agree that, like, I think I think the writing the writing in their recent games has been a lot better, and I'm I'm curious, you know, kind of how how much they'll go back to Max's style of speaking versus their new, you know, proficiency in writing. Yeah. Um, and also, like, are they going to commit to a canon ending of that first game? Um, yeah. Because, like, it could end in really different ways. And, like, I, you know, some characters may or may not be there depending on the decisions you made. Yeah, that, that ending was always one that really stuck with people, too, is that, you know, there's so many games where this or that changes the ending, big decision. That one's really stuck out of all of the other ones because it was such a pull. I, I feel like it was one of those 50-50s. I bet 50% of the people did A, 50% of the people did B. And I remember standing there for a long time thinking what should i do like and where in a world where telltale was doing similar stuff and it sort of felt like any choice you made didn't really have that much of an impact like i remember in season one of of um the walking dead it's like do you save ben or carly and i remember sweating about it and being like oh my god like who am i gonna pick blah 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 only to learn that they kill off whoever you don't kill two minutes later it so it didn't matter right. so it's like oh like whatever and this was that era where those kind of games were really ramping up and people were getting excited about it and that change felt pretty great and there was other instances in the game where like all the kate stuff like if you mess up the kate stuff oh yeah yeah you yeah. felt really cruddy after for the rest of the game and it was very much dependent on were you paying attention or not and there's no double chances you either do it or you don't like it was very good at that uh yes i uh i agree and i'm i'm excited to see uh, what they're doing with it yeah um i was you know what let's talk about it they're making a new gears of war <laughs> yeah um, are you a gears of war guy yes and like recently i oh. i didn't play any of them on release i uh my my entire fandom of the series has been since five came out which has been uh several years at this point but um i played all of them or all of the mainline series uh while doing research for a video that i did about orbital lasers <laughs> a couple <laughs> years ago um and and i always thought of them as these like dumb broy shooters and was so impressed with both how well they do the dumb bro shooter thing, but also, like, that they have, they've actually got a lot more going on, that the characters are really well-written, the world is interesting. I think the things that they have to say about, like, war is actually a lot more nuanced than hmm. you would expect from, yeah. from this kind of series. Um, and my other part of the fandom is the one thing that I did, uh, you know, partake in, at the time of release is I remember that first Gears of War trailer with the Gary Jules Mad World 
like theme like yes. i saw that on tv and was like shocked i i was like a game trailer can look like this so it's kind of cheating for them to use the mad world thing in the gears of war trailer again but like it worked strings. on me yeah i i like they were they were playing it and i was like god damn it i am susceptible to emotion i am excited for this so yeah i was talking to leo about this because i haven't played any of them and he recommended them as a really good like couples game like a co-op partner game yeah and to go back to five and maybe just play that one would you agree or is there other entries we could play too I mean, you could play both, both four and five are, so basically like the original trilogy is, is with like the same people all throughout. Um, they were all on like the Xbox 360. Um, then four and five kind of start like a new generation of, uh, of the story. Like there are still guys from the previous stuff. But four is kind of where it starts, and five is a continuation. Okay. Um, and then, as people have pointed out, five ends on a pretty big cliffhanger, and this game that they just announced is a prequel to one. So oh. it, it, it might be a little frustrating, actually, to be like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? And then you, like, don't get I to have to also wait out. eight years with the rest of you. <laughs> yeah, but but five is a great co-op game. And four, hmm. four is less good than five, but, like, still really fun. Um I yeah. always chalk them up to be dude bro shoot 'em ups. So I'm I'm that's fun to hear that there's actually if I scratch the surface more I might find something I'm more interested in because you know I grew up playing like the Halo campaigns with my brother, all the COD campaigns with my brother. I'm used to sh dude bro shoot 'em ups. Like that's fine with me. I, I like those. But something about that world was really dark and gritty and gray that I was like ah oh, I'd rather play the Halo than this. I think so. I leaned that way, but. I don't know. It's making me want to go back and and play five now. Yeah, I think. I mean, you are you are totally right in that they were you know they were like the epitome of the Unreal Engine shooter where they yeah. were just gray and gritty and had dudes with you know like forearms <laughs> the size of a tree trunk and they yeah. all kind of just like yelled at each other. Um, and, and I think, I think now it is actually fun to revisit those first three games because that's not as in vogue now and so it's kind of like a nostalgia trip rather than being like "Ugh, this is the only thing coming out yeah um but four and five are make conscious efforts to change that um and like the the main the main character of five uh is a woman so that's something <laughs> uh but but also you have like like in the beginning of five the main character, like, or one of the main characters basically, like, commits a war crime, and then, like, a lot of the game is, like, how the hell do we deal with this relationship now that this dude has, like, committed a war crime, and we all have to, like, live with it? It's really interesting. It's, it's, it, you know, yeah, they deserve more credit than they've gotten in the past. Yeah, for sure. Now I want to give it, is there anything in that trailer besides their nostalgia twing with the music that you were like oh hell yeah because i i kind of saw that and i was like scary guy gets shot in the head and then a hole and then they look at a city so it was like completely lost on me i didn't know if something crazy got revealed or something yeah not not that much crazy it does seem like they've said they're committed to making the locusts who are like the main enemy uh they want to make them scary again which i think is a cool goal because over time like that dude who he was fighting are basically the grunt enemies and over time they just were grunts you know they you didn't you didn't we weren't scared of them anymore yeah. um so i like the idea of, of making them more imposing i also think like the setting of gears of war is basically the entire world it is like already post-apocalypse kind of that like the invasion of these bug aliens has already happened um and so this is like this is E Day, Emergence Day. And so seeing, you know, they showed like a cityscape that was like a big modern looking city in a way that does not really exist in okay. most of the other Gears of War games because everything's already kind of like decrepit. Um, and so like playing through kind of a more uh, a pre apocalypse as opposed to a post apocalypse is an interesting concept. Uh, yeah, that is interesting. Know, I feel like not a lot of media does start po like post without ever showing anything pre for six entries like that's pretty crazy they've never gone back to e-day this whole time yeah i mean you've seen like cutscenes of it and they do 
like they rebuild and so there are other big cities but yes it is it is actually surprising that they haven't really mm. done um i mean like the tactics game actually that leo really likes is kind of a prequel but i don't think it's this far this back. far uh, okay yeah cool neat no that's it's that's interesting i do i'm i'm curious about that i am in my era of playing going back and playing stuff and then i end up loving it like literally remedy is my favorite thing in the world now and this time last year i didn't play a single remedy. you know what i mean like i yeah. need to uh -huh. wart, i need to follow those intuitions like maybe i would like this um my next one was mixtape and this was in the the mm, xbox mm -hmm. stream this this looks really cool so it, it was edited to be like a movie trailer they had the coming this summer voice guy talking over it very uh, perks of being a wallflower vibes with the way the characters are. Yeah, or like Lady Bird. Lady Bird. They even had like the car stand up scene from Perks of Being yeah. a Wallflower. I was like, okay, I get it. But I think what's cool about this is they're really leading into the music side of games. And I know like that makes it hard for streamers. I saw it in our chat even. It's like unstreamable game, unstreamable game. Fair enough. But like, shouldn't those exist sometimes? Like, why should we never make games that are bespoke yeah, around? Most people aren't streamers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like 99% of people are not streaming and like i know life is strange and other series also have uh, you know highly copyrightable music in them and then you can do the stream remote and it's a thousand times worse that, did you ever see that clip of when they're they're supposed to be playing a rock song and then it's yes like and it's just silent gone. and you can hear like the foot noises <laughs> yeah they didn't even layer like some fake rock riffs over top it's just completely silent and it's, it's like three and a half minutes long so you're like what the hell is going on when i talk about game ip i do presentations sometimes at schools i include that to show like to show the differences in copyrightability of games versus music i'm like notice how they can play the entire like clip of the video game on here but the song would be crazy and i'd let that play yeah. for like a minute just to see show how awkward it is but i really like that they're like They'll probably have a stream remote and it'll have different music too. But I really like the thought that a game is being made similar to like, you know, like my favorite album of all time is um, Digital Love. Uh, not Digital Love. Um, yeah. Wait, what's that? It's my favorite album and I'm blanking. I sound like such a freaking faker. The Daft Punk album, uh, Discovery. Oh, sure. Yeah. And it's uh, Interstellar 5555, like that movie that is just that album, but a movie be, like uh -huh. sculpted to those songs like if we could have more games like that that'd be super cool and i kind of think that's what this is doing maybe yeah and this is this is an is it an annapurna joint or does it just have that um, vibe i think I it is an probably, annapurna joint it is it looks annapurna, it. right <laughs> because because annapurna has done that before with that um uh what is that game the artful escape doesn't have oh, licensed yeah. music but that is basically like a music video for for the whole time yeah, and yeah, obviously yeah. like they just have connections where they're more able to like license music i think oh it's the same um, devs don't bash ash is saying no oh, okay there yeah. you go well, there you go <laughs> um yeah but i i agree i thought i thought this looked really cool i really liked the art style of like the kind of like we we actually saw kind of mixed frame rate characters multiple times we because did. there was also that um south that xbox midnight? game south of midnight yeah that yeah. uh that had that but i really i really like the look of this and i am yeah i'm totally down for more just kind of like slice of life coming of age uh you know kids kids growing up with music uh, yeah. type stories that seemed awesome and it seemed like the cutscenes were edited like a film would be edited because it's you know sometimes it's like oh games movie tv whatever there are tropes in editing that are only specific to certain types of media and it's fun when those crisscross to be yeah. in games like i think it'll definitely have that leaning to because it's trying to seem like a movie with obviously gameplay in it so it'd be fun to see people who have experience with editing together films, maybe take a crack at editing together a cutscene for a video game. I, I think that'd be cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited for it. Okay, we should probably start talking about Alan Wake soon. I know, because uh, if we don't want to so go too <laughs> long. To <laughs> um, but I will say um, I'm really excited about Cairn, um, the, the yeah. new 
game from the Game Bakers that is about climbing a mountain. Um, uh, the Game Bakers, uh, their first game, Fury, spelled F-U-R-I, is one of my favorite games. It's like a boss rush. Uh, Gameplay-wise, it doesn't look anything like this, but I just, I like them. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we had we had Jusant last year, which was one of our favorite games, made it on the 210s. And, like, my biggest complaint about Jusant was, like, this is such a great idea. I wish the climbing was harder. You know, Jusant was ultimately, like, a very easy game where you didn't yeah. have to think about it this much. And, like, this trailer for Cairn is selling difficulty. You know, like, it really looks like they want you to be, like, trying and failing to climb different stretches of the mountain over and over. And, like, that's that's just, like, a really compelling pitch to me. Yeah, like, most of the trailer was showing failure over and over again. Yeah. It showed her and, and then that the woman, top, like, barely. screaming and, yeah. like, being frustrated. <laughs> Like, getting to the top made you want to just shriek. Yeah, whereas Jusant, yeah. it was like, I'm up here, let's keep going. I love Jusant, too. Right. That was a great game. But, no, yeah, I'm curious to to see that. And, like, in the trailer, we were all laughing. It's like, like she has shaky legs, like, if you don't hold it for yeah. too long. And she, you can hear her breath really start to suffer if she's holding on for too long. It was almost giving me anxiety to, to watch, but playing it probably would be tenfold. Mm -hmm. I want to be yeah, freaking out. Yeah, real sweaty hands game. <laughs> super sweaty hands game i'm curious to see how it plays like how they're going because it looked like it was similar to like grow home where it's like right hand right yeah. trigger left hand left trigger feet and then you like lift up to switch to your feet i, I would imagine half the battle of making a game like that is just figuring out how it's going to play because if it doesn't yeah, feel like good, i need more buttons on the controller yeah if it doesn't feel good people will bounce so it needs to feel good first for you to want to climb yeah mm-hmm all right. And then the best announcement of Summer Games Fest was that Alan Wake, you know, Sam Lake came out in this cute ass little puffy blue shirt. He's he so cute. He did a little dance. He, he did, did a little the, dance. Show me the champion of light. <laughs> he did a little, he even played a short audio clip so he could do it for a second. And he did, he came out and he was like, oh, we know you really want to see DLC. Looks at pretend watch. It comes out tomorrow. And then we just got the first DLC for Alan Wake. Um, and it's so freaking good. Yeah, the first DLC being like, they could have released this as three DLCs. They could have. You know, it, it felt like a treat that I just got to play them all at the same time. I know, yeah. So it's called Night Springs. It's three episodes. They were each, I, I don't know if it's a spoiler to say how long they were, maybe. No. It's like 45 minutes 45 long. 45 minutes, an hour each. And they were all great. And But then the, there was one in particular that I was just absolutely wanting to write a dissertation afterwards, level energy. I just... Love what they do there so much. And I think these things are so fun is because they're having fun. You can tell they're having so much freaking fun making this stuff. And it translates so well, not just because we see Sam Lakes in there, like actually seeming like he's having fun with Sean in that third episode, but because everything just radiates like, oh, I just hope this studio is around forever because they know what they're doing now and they've found their stride and they're just sprinting and it's so fun to see that especially we just played max Payne, the first one for something rotten recently to see that little nugget of the origins yeah, aren't you glad you did that now? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was like i was like screaming like oh my god they put max Payne in this the freaking web comic stuff that came up that was in max Payne too that was in the third episode of this oh so good but let's backtrack to we can talk about them episode by episode so episode one Okay, and so how how much are we talking about these? Are we are we spoiling them? I want to, but I don't I, want to I deter feel like people. We should, I feel like we should just spoil. I, they're like they're so short. I kind of yeah. Like the interesting thing about them would be spoilers. That's true. Okay, we're forty minutes into bonus pod. If you don't want to hear, well, all that we're talking about the rest of this is just going to be spoiling this stuff. Mini max spoilers of. Alamite DLC. Sorry, but you have to bounce now if you don't want to hear that, because we do just need to chat about it, I think. It it warrants that kind of open-ended discussion instead of just barely yeah. skimming it. So, goodbye everybody who doesn't want to hear. Hello, everybody who wants to hear. Um, the Rose one. What did you think of that one? The very first one. I I mean, that one is, is the most purely comedic yeah. uh, by far. Um, and I was just so... I really liked... I, well, first off, I, Whirlindor does such a good job of introducing all of these. And obviously mm -hmm. he is doing, so it's like Night Springs is just, 
it is it is just the twilight zone you yeah. know like it is they're they're doing like a you know rod sterling style sterling sterling um uh like introduction to to each one where he's like imagine if you will a small town uh, where a, a woman is obsessed with a writer um but yeah. like then so the this first one what i found was so funny is that they didn't they didn't need to like spell out for you exactly what was going on you just kind of were able to realize it where you're playing as what what's her name rose you're playing as rose and uh, who's who's like the waitress um in in town and you start as the waitress and you're just going through and everyone is just like so in love with you and they're like hey rose i heard that your writer's fan page just won best fan page in the world how do you do it and she's like i guess i'm just really talented and i work really hard and like everything is just you so know like, it's just the fan fiction version of her life yeah exactly um and then she gets she gets a call from uh from the writer uh saying that he needs help and she goes into her back room where she has 12 shotguns and 12 rifles <laughs> and straps them on. And then it's like, it's also weirdly the most combat heavy one yeah. where you're just going around headshotting dudes and, uh, and tracking down, uh, you meet, you meet the writer's brother who's like <laughs> who's scratch. evil. Yeah. But, it, but it's like, you know, he doesn't introduce himself as scratch. He's just yeah. like a writer's brother. And he's just kind of like a, he's like an evil greaser. Um, <laughs> And and yeah, you just you just kind of live out this like fantasy of hers where you uh, you fight through it. Uh, at the end, you fight Scratch. He has the line, "My motorcycle is also a werewolf." <laughs> That's gotta be in our best moments. I died. It's like, and also my motorcycle is a werewolf. Arr! And then the motorcycle just turns into this white wolf that also starts fighting you i also it's died so when funny. you're like you're just she starts listing all this stuff she's like i'm gonna scold you and starts like telling him what awful person he is he's like quiet i don't want to be seen and he's like no i don't, I don't yeah <laughs> it's it's so funny i mean and i um i also really like throughout all these i like that they basically remove all difficulty yes. from the game that and i mean in this you have like literally hundreds of rounds of bullets ammunition. At one point. you have a fully automatic shotgun like and a rifle yeah you can just do whatever and so they are these kind of like power fantasies which makes sense because like she's you know she's writing this story for herself yeah basically um yeah and then at the end you find some version of alan and he cracks a big old smile that looks like someone put like a face app smile on <laughs> Alan Wake. And it's so funny. And yeah, it's like this one I don't feel like is particularly deep, but I no. enjoyed it the whole time. It's so fun. It's just purely what fun. They they wanted to give us a uh, how would it feel to be Rose getting everything she ever wanted? Because Rose is such an interesting character in Alan Wake, too, because I really think they leave it up in the air if Rose is just a crazy obsessed girl or the dark place has affected Rose in a certain way. And I right. don't know which one it is. And I think that's the fun is, is she just mm -hmm. a stalker and she happens to show up when Alan needs her or is she using the dark place and the presence within her? Cause in Alan Wake one, she gets like attacked by the, the you know, the dark presence and then is different afterwards. But Part of me just thinks, I think Rose is just freaking crazy. I mean, she did have his standee in the diner when we first meet her before she gets attacked. So she was slightly stalkerish to begin with. But there are so many little nuances, like everything's pink in the world. And I think it's because she has rose colored uh -huh. glasses on, I think is the joke they're trying to make. So she's just completely yep. deluded by love and infatuation that everything's cheery. You know, when she dodges, she goes, hee hee. <laughs> and like giggles a little bit and you're just like what is happening when she you reload her gun she's like my gun's really hungry and like shoves the bullets in it was yep. so and i noticed that the ui was really trying to make me hold down r2 to shoot they're like don't don't worry about bullets this is an automated shotgun remember remember right. it, it told me three or four times when i was being because i'm used to alan wake too is be careful with my ammo don't shoot if you don't need to and the ui would remind me like remember you have an automated shotgun hold down r2 for god's sakes like that's what this is supposed to be 
And then, yeah, and then it's fun that you don't know if this is just a little dumb thing or if this is actually happening in lore and this is like one of Alan's attempts to escape via writing what if Rose got to me via fanfic or something. Or right. I even went back and started it over just to see, you know, at the, at the start of each one, it says teleplay by Alan Wake hosted by Moreland door. And I was like, I wonder if the first one's teleplay by Rose. Like if Rose was the one who wrote that and then the, it became reality via the dark place. So I even went mm-hmm. back to check. It does say Alan wrote it, but I don't know. It just, it, yeah, it could well, be and real, it's, you know, and it's like, or it's Alan, you know, writing from like uh, she is the kind of um, Stephen King's Misery is the book yeah. about like uh, uh, the person who's obsessed with the writer's character, like trapping him, uh, you know. And it's like maybe Alan is writing this from her perspective, you know, whatever. It's these kind of thought experiments that you can just kind of go forever with, with yeah. this game. Uh, but because yeah, that's what American I, um... Nightmare was like. Like the first DLC for Alan Wake, American Nightmare was one of his attempts to escape that didn't work. Right. So yeah, it yeah, would yeah. track that maybe that's what these are too. But of course the whole fun yeah, of it is not knowing. that she's rescuing him. Yeah. That would be very <laughs> funny. Cause like that is potentially a narrative that could work because she has shown the agency to want to save him. You know how everything has to be based in some pseudo purpose. And like, uh, Sam Lake has a phrase for it. Uh, I can't remember it now. But it's like, he can't just write, and then I was saved and walk out of the dark place. It has to narratively follow a through line that's believable and real. They have a phrase for it in Remedy that I can't remember. But that would be one that, like, tracks. Yeah. Hmm. And then the second one, we got to be freaking Jesse Faden. Hell yeah, I was so excited. So this one, that you go back. That was their big, like, mic drop trailer moment. Yes. Was like, oh, baby, Jesse's back. Jesse's back. Also, the music in between the Night Spring song. I listen to that all the time in my car, anyways. But oh, oh the my one god, that's like Space Invader. Yeah, so <laughs> good. <laughs> I <laughs> I was joking. Like, gonna tell my sister this is a Sabrina Carpenter song, so she'll let me play it in the car this summer. It sounds like a like a Dua Lipa song. <laughs> it does. I mean, it really is a bop. It's a bop. It sounds like it could be on the radio if you just ignored how silly the <laughs> the lyrics are. Um, Radio songs are silly, too. That's true. There's songs about hula hoops, and that's all it is. It's just a song about a hula hoop. So if that can go on the radio, this can. Um, I liked the second one. It was probably my least favorite of the three, but I still liked it. It was just really cool to be Jessie again in this specific world where her pow- she doesn't have her powers, I guess, because the whole point of control is like yeah. she can fly, she can zoot around. It's a whole power fantasy sort of thing you're just unstoppable I to ask you about this one because i have not played control since it came out and i did not play the dlc for it mm-hmm. and so i'm not clear where jesse is as a character right now like when she was saying like my brother has been like kidnapped by you know a secret government agency yeah i was like is, was that part of control that i forgot i mean i know she was looking for her brother within the plot but like yeah it, it it wasn't clear to me whether she was in that role like the director of the federal bureau of control or if this was yeah. like some other reality where she was not that it was giving pre-control vibes like because she has polaris who she has at the start of control too which is that her right inside her brain corporeal girlfriend I guess you know like whatever and you know yeah she's still looking for Dylan and she doesn't have any of her powers so I was leaning more towards either this isn't the Jesse we've played as and it's some multiverse Jesse who hasn't done all that stuff yet or it's our Jesse and she just hasn't gone through the events of control because the first thing they hit you with is a locked gate which in control she could just fly over if she wanted to and she doesn't she's like how am I gonna get in here so I think maybe that was their way of saying she has none of her powers. Get used to it. Just walk around. And it would make sense for yeah. her to be pre all the events of control. Yeah. And, and obviously she didn't have like her gun or whatever. Yeah. Either. Yeah. Um, yeah. I this one was really it was really interesting just for me trying to square like what is going on? Because this was also one where it's like the ending of this one i was like what is this does this have 
ramifications? The question with all of these are kind of like, how one-off are they? And how much do they have ramifications for like yeah. the wider Alan Wake universe? I have to think everything is canon. That's my natural inclination. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly the, yeah, the, the last one kind of makes that explicit. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but this one was a bit slower. It was more puzzly. You're back in coffee world. You're walking around. You have to backtrack to talk to Tim's there, and you have to solve a few puzzles, do, learn about some prime numbers to open up a safe and get in and, and that kind of stuff. But it was interesting in that, just the fact that you're Jesse, like if you were any other character, but Jesse, this would probably be a drag. I think just the fact that they're combining the IP in, in this drastic way before control two comes out even too, right? Like who knows what's going to happen in control two with its combination of Alan Wake now, because obviously those two worlds are collided. We've seen that already in Alan Wake two. It's kind of setting up expectations for being Jesse in a post remedy universe, more explicit world. Yeah. But it was probably um, my least favorite, but it was still good. Yeah, the uh, the structure of this one was just annoying because you're just trying to get into a warehouse and you keep yeah. having to, you go there and then you have to solve a puzzle and like go somewhere else. You know, Coffee World is fun. Yeah. Um, and, but, but like the, the breaker stuff was the best part of this one. And then obviously the third one, you know, it blows that out of the water. Yeah. Um. But okay, so at the end, just to just to say it, so she's, you know, she's going looking around for for information on her brother, or the agency that took him or whatever. Um, Tim keeps being like, "Don't drink the coffee," and then you like get into this thing, and he has drank the coffee, and he's like hypnotized, and he's you know totally brainwashed, and then you like go down this big ladder, and Alan is like hovering <laughs> there among mountains of coffee thermoses oh my god yeah and and i was just like what's going on <laughs> like i really i really did not know what to make of that ending other than i guess it's her just you know it's like alan is the god of this world kind of he whatever he writes turns into some form of reality yeah and so this is just what okay what was the control DLC with Alan Wake? Like, what was the, what happened in that? It was really focused on the doctor who lied to Alan, who was the one that had that expensive retreat place where famous people came and like learned to get right. better. He was like the big scary monster in that for most of it. It was like, oh no, what's he become? Because ultimately when, the AWE happens, the FCC goes and like tidies up and makes it so it seems like what happened didn't happen and tries to get control of whatever event happened and all that kind of stuff. But the doctor was kind of like a missing piece because he sort of, we didn't, never really knew what happened to him after the events of Alan Wake 1. So that was filling in those cracks a bit. And it was Jesse fighting him and learning more about what was going on Alan Wake's like you got a lot of context on what happened between Alan Wake one and two to those characters that got left behind who weren't Alan or his wife um post gotcha. aw post um awe and that's kind of what it was for you fight him at the end he's kind of a hard boss fight but it was still mostly control stuff it's not like you ever go to anywhere in the Alan Wake games or ever you're, you're always in the oldest house it's just you'll get context clues from reading all the docs and then fighting that doctor guy at the end because he turned into some crazy monster because he got really into the dark presence and learning more about it. I think he like went into the lake and came out again all crazy or something to that effect. I can't quite remember, but it was more about the the B-list characters from that game and what happened to them. Okay, so it wasn't... She was not... She did not interact with Alan. He had some FMV moments in that game because that game has those FMV moments where it's like she hears visions and sees like the, the old director talking to her or something like that. Alan did pop up a few times talking to her in that way in the DLC. What he said, I can't really okay. remember, <laughs> but what I'm, I was, I was kind of thinking maybe, so at the end of the, of this DLC episode, Alan's in that big tank and that's the tank that her brother Dylan was in at the end of control. 
Oh, that's right. So he's hanging in that tank in the same way Dylan is. And I really think the thermoses are just them joking about how... I, I About coffee, yeah. Well, also the fact that we all really want that diner thermos that I am 8-bit sells out in eight seconds. <laughs> yeah. I genuinely think that's a reference to that because when I went down the bunker and there was just rows and rows of thermoses, like so many that everyone in the world could have their own thermos kind of thing. I think they're joking about that because I really want one of those thermoses. This is why I know so much about that. So I have Twitter alerts on for I am a bit and also <laughs> remedy <laughs> to see if they'll announce when the thermoses are getting restocked. Cause eventually they were like, Oh, it's going to be two per person. They're coming back in June. And then they were like, okay, now it's one per person. Like we really want to make sure everyone has one. We understand everyone wants this thermos. Please be patient with us. Blah, blah, blah. So I think the thermoses are kind of a joke. It's just like, here's your freaking thermoses. So yeah, I, I mean, and even, <laughs> even not what's fanning the merch, it's like the series is just so obsessed with coffee. I mean, yeah. there's a thing in the third one where you can pick to either drink tea or coffee. And yes. I chose tea. And they were like, well, I don't know why you didn't pick your favorite drink, coffee. But OK, you drink tea. <laughs> I chose coffee because I felt like they wanted yeah. me to. But yeah, I think him being in Dylan's space was maybe just, again, the same theory of like, this is another writing attempt of Alan trying to get saved using Jesse's search of her brother as an excuse to find him by mistake to find him yeah, yeah that's a good that's a good point um, um so that's yeah because i was the most confused by that one though it is because it's like jesse has basically the most agency and knowledge of the world of anyone outside alan yes in this you know it's like if anyone can figure out what he's dealing with it's it's either alice his wife or jesse but yeah. it, like jesse is jesse is like the one who's like successfully fought stuff before and yeah. won yeah true it's always the women in um, these games who figure out how to get out of the dark place look, in eight it's, seconds. it's it's, it's <laughs> absurd male writers who like can't help but write themselves into hell and everyone else and the woman's like, i don't want right, any well, help deal with it. leave me alone yeah. <laughs> um do you know the thing this is this is an aside uh but do you know the thing about like how like a, a huge amount of great film editors are women you know that like like there obviously there is there is a, a a whole you know tangled web of of gender dynamics and misogyny but it's like a lot of the great directors that we think about are men but like a lot of their movies are edited by women and it's oh, like more more than you would think including like big action movies that we typically think of as like man stuff and it really <laughs> does it it feels like this is playing in the same realm where it's like if you want me to make this good it just can't be your like dumb thoughts braid out all over this book. You know, you yeah. need someone to rein you in a little bit. Someone to contextualize it and put it in a row <laughs> and make it yeah. a thing to look at. That's interesting. Um, okay. Anyway, the third one, oh. uh, the money, the money, the best one. I love, so this is what makes me, I need to go play quantum break. Now I've needed a kick in the butt to play quantum break. This was it because I really wanted to know all the context of what was happening. It's, so it starts off in so, oh my God, the funniest way where it's Sean who plays Tim in Quantum Break. That's his character's name, right? Tim? Um, well, he's, isn't he Tim in... Or he's Tim in Control? Alan Wake. Or yeah, in Alan Wake because he's Tim Breaker. Tim Breaker. What's his or... name in Quantum Break? I can't remember, but uh, he, he's gosh. playing that character, but he, they can't say yeah. that because they don't have the rights to Quantum Break. But they get, I mean, they get more explicit about it. Yeah. Then that he's, he's Jack Joyce in, uh, in Quantum Break. Gotcha. Um, or yes, he's Jack Joyce. Um, yeah, but, but they say, I mean, they get explicit to the point where he's like, are we going to do the FMVs again? And then Sam Lake is like, yeah, like last time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very fun. I, they're doing the most fun stuff with real human faces not being copyright infringement. Like there's a real big difference yeah. between personality rights and copyrights. And 
while you can argue that Sam Lake's face is Max Payne, he's also himself and he's allowed to do stuff with his face, especially within his own studio. Where the uh-huh. line is to he crosses into Max Payne copyright infringement is is a very unexplored area of entertainment law that I think they're really pushing the envelope on and it's very fun to see. Like when he does the Max Payne face, has he pushed the line from Sam Lake to Max Payne? Where we don't care about yeah, his personality like, rights to copy. That's just the face he made. That's just you know, his you face, tell man. Sam Lake that he can't make a face. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting. Yeah, but also we see another like weird part of this is this is Sam Lake as voiced by Sam Lake. Yes, yeah. As opposed to every other time in Alan Wake where or or Max Payne where it's his face but voiced by James McCaffrey and McCaffrey has sadly died mm-hmm. but also like it is when you see him you're not like oh that's Alex Casey or that's Max Payne it's like oh wait no this one is Sam yeah, Lake distinctly. and then, and they call him Sam you know it's like yeah. they say his name yeah and even when he's in Alan Wake too it's always fmv it's always him sitting on the couch with Warlin, but they call him sam and he's, and he's dubbed yeah, Al- right? yeah and he's dubbed but yeah this was him actually speaking and i also love how self-aware they are with like all their um acronyms they're like the acronyms are getting to be a bitch too much and then sam goes on this rant he's like but you have the dvm that goes into the fvp yeah, and he's then like, they're a little mystery <laughs> he's like very much just like enjoying himself and explaining it entrenched yeah. in the lore of th- this thing he's created trying to explain it to somebody it's like how it feels when i'm trying to explain remedy verse stuff to somebody who's like i'm kind of interested in alan wake too like do you think i'd like it it's like buckle in i have to give you 20 proper nouns no, we, <laughs> we all turn into charlie day pepe sylvia you know it's <laughs> yeah. like they, you can't do it and not be like pointing at a whiteboard it's very true and yeah so that was a very fun place to start it off with and then they just snowball it forward to Essentially, what is my favorite thing that Remedy does, which is just like meta narrative insanity, which multimedia meta narrative stuff, which is like what we talked about in the deepest dive, which is what if we combined meta narrative fourth wall breaking winky faces to multimedia um, like explorations of different forms of artistic expression? Yeah, and and actually what it's doing here is interesting in in that Alan Wake 2 does not do this where it's like Alan Wake 2 has it has FMVs and has gameplay and it often mixes the FMVs and the gameplay in like really cool ways mm-hmm. but this is doing different doing like different graphical styles yeah. which i don't think I mean, that's not, they don't do that in Control. They no. don't do that in Max Payne. So I think this is like pretty new for no, them. Yeah. It's like, it's going, now it's intermediate. Now it's not just multi, it's going into one of the forms and stretching it out into different platforms also. They're insane. Yeah. Like, oh. I... Yeah, so so the plot is is that Tim Breaker, he thinks he's playing, or, you know, he, he thinks he's playing Tim Breaker in a uh, in a video game that uh poison pill studio is making which is obviously like the opposite of remedy which is very (laughs) funny um and then he gets well he goes to his dressing room and he sees a version of himself that's dead and he's like insanely he's like oh what a funny prank for (laughs) sam lake to play on me (laughs) which is like going to a room and seeing your own dead body like a perfect copy and being like what a good prank um and Jesse shows up, and Jesse's like, oh, man, we didn't reach him in time. Door is killing versions of you. Um, and then he gets sucked into another world where he's, you know, at first you're just kind of, like, in um, in, 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 the, in the forest in, like, a very Alan Wake 2 style forest. Yeah. And you find, you have to find these kind of, uh, I don't know, tetrahedrozonals or they they wrote it down yes. at one point did you read that thing yeah. on the ground of the where he got shot in the first no i was actually about to and then it, it took me to the next scene before oh. i could read it oh no okay that it was really funny it's it's literally a script for the scene happening but it's like a game it's like a a, a game script but it looks like a film script but it's essentially like 
you know, Sean walks in, sees the, it describes exactly what's happening. And then it's like, if player uh-huh. clicks on this script and then it like shows the line he said when you click on the script, like, oh, what's this? And then it's like, description oh, of script on the ground. One, one, this exact script on ground. And it's just like detailing it in a game dev way while still looking like a film script. Uh, that's very, very funny. Very fun. Sorry, keep going. Um, yeah, okay. So you you have to find these these these. Uh, tetrahedrals uh to <laughs> to power up what looks like a playstation move controller that you're holding yes. you know some some kind of uh you know thing of power while you're doing that you hear shots and you find another version of your dead body also in this world he's got like long hair and a beard he he looks like robin williams like what year is it yeah. kind of guy like he's just been out there for a while um but in in every in each level, you basically have to find this shape and put it into a TV. And so he does it the first time to escape, but he realizes it takes him to a hotel and he quickly realizes that like, oh, I was thinking about Dor, so it, uh, Dor the character. Uh, and so it took me to this place that's very strongly associated with Dor. Mm-hmm. And then you're back in the hotel and you have to do this whole this whole hotel puzzle lobby thing. It's all in black and white. This part was a, a, a puzzle that I wasn't super fond of. Did, yeah, did the it, clocks did it pointed away. Uh, yeah, well, I, I figured it out without even looking to the left thing that told you which room is where. I just remembered, oh, I've been in the noon clock, I've been to the three o'clock clock, and I've been, I haven't been in this one, so I guess I'll go in here. And then I realized that there was like an index that told me what room was what clock. I was like, oh, okay. It wasn't a puzzle. It was literally just notice the signs or not, and they were clocks. <laughs> but it was it was a puzzle because you did have to go to them in a specific order, and I went oh. to them in a wrong order. See, maybe I, so by I mistake, to... did the perfect order. I just was like, that was yeah, a little boring. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. You know, it, it's, it's interesting. Something that I found kind of interesting about it is that Dor has not been, like, a frightening character yeah throughout the game but they start doing like jump scares with him where they're like flashing the you know door it's the same scratch jump scares for alan that we we yeah yeah. door yeah um and you know so you get through this hotel uh, another sequence of puzzles i do love that they have uh you know they're playing the finished music in one of them Mm -hmm. and like whenever that song is playing i just stop and listen to it because it's so good Mm -hmm. um but then you, so then you transition from that. You're like, I'm thinking really hard. I'm going to go uh, back to the studio. Is which which happens first? Is it the is it the the, the 2D game or the comic book? I think the comic book's next, and he learns that he's good at focusing. Right. Okay. So he he focuses really hard, and he goes, and he wakes up in in a comic book in the style of basically the max Payne cut yeah. scenes and it's and it's like my thoughts written out loud in yellow text and it like <laughs> says that above him and it's doing i mean it's doing very much this thing where like max Payne re- uh re- realizes that he's in a video game like it's just it's it's incredibly meta um but jesse's there and she tells him like uh hey you're here they're looking for versions of you. I thought it was a different version, but I think you're actually the like the main guy mm-hmm. because you are so good at going between dimensions. Yeah. Uh which which was funny because I was like, he's so good at it. He just had to think of a place and go there, but apparently not everyone can do that. I know, I kind of liked how it was giving some cuz a lot of the the joke of Alan Wake is Alan Wake is the spe- he always oh, so special he's Alan Wake the writer capital w isn't he special and then he's like just not very good of a writer yeah he's not <laughs> yeah. that great so like everyone was calling Sean and this the actor capital a like we've got to get the actor the actor is blah 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 so i was kind of thinking maybe it's like he's he's method acting or something like his ability to act is allowing him to traverse the dark place in a very unique way in the same way alan's writing lets him morph the dark place was what i thought they were kind of saying because the dark place takes creative expression and tries to use that to to infiltrate the real world so in the same way a writer would write their way out of the dark place he's like trying to act his way out 
I guess. Yeah, that maybe he's so good at assuming different identities that he can then jump between these. Yeah. You know, the whole reason that Ben doesn't trust a- actors <laughs> because they're they're liars. Exactly. Um, yeah, so so Jesse tells him he's really good. And I feel like at this point, he's she's not at the Federal Bureau of Control. It's called something else. Yeah. Um, I can't remember what the, it is, but it's like a building from our control. something corporation, the the reverse something corporation. Yeah, but they're they're satirizing that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, but it's like it's satirizing, but it also is like this is canon, and the Federal <laughs> Bureau of Control is canon because what this this one really is introducing is like all of the multiverses are real. They are all connected. Yeah. You know, like it is it is the kind of like. Uh, you know, everything, everywhere, all at once. Like, in this multiverse, you just made a different choice. And in this one, yeah, everything's the same, except instead of being called the Fu- Federal Bureau of Control, it's called this thing. But they're all legit. They're all real. Yeah. Um, and then you you focus again, and you go into a 2D side-scrolling game with a graphical style of, like, gosh another world or something like it's a really specific 2d where it's not traditional pixel art it's more it almost looks like the characters in mortal kombat 1 or something where they're like real people who are uh, pixelated um the the sound effects uh, sounded really familiar too but i couldn't place them like hissing sounds when you shoot like oh oh yeah yeah. what's that from but I, i couldn't place it yeah, I, I'm not sure. But this one, you know, it's like the gameplay was nothing. You just kind of uh, stood there and shot people. But they did have, like, pixelated versions of the door jump scare popping up, yeah. which were also really good. Um, And then you eventually get out of there, and you get to, like, the end of the world in this very... I look like a freaking, like, Dark Souls level, mm-hmm. where you just have all of these, like, empty shells tetrahedrals you know like all over and and it's you're just kind of in this this abyss and you're running around and shooting people um and eventually you find another shape and can go through another tv and then it's like hey you thought that was the void no way man the void is a is a black screen text adventure i was so gagged i loved that because and they started out with being like you realize that your thoughts are just that exactly like written outward. Like that is all yeah. you are. And I'm like, Oh my God, that's so interesting. Cause that is all like, if we were to take games and put it down to its purest form, it's where it started with text-based adventure stuff. We literally went from three to two to what could a game be? One D it's text-based adventure. That's what it would be. And they yeah. really played with that too. It wasn't like it was just a gag. Like it was a really interesting well-written text-based adventure thing i was going through yeah, and you know they're even doing stuff where it's like the text the speed that the text is written out is like part of the storytelling mm, true um and there's so there's a whole thing where i wasn't sure if it would my guess is you'd have to do both either way but there's a part where it's like focus on the door or focus mm-hmm. on jesse and then if you focus on jesse you go to like a different another alternate reality with Jesse, who is like not engaged in being, you know, in this multiverse stuff at all. She's just like a lady and you like live out a whole life with her where it's like, she's a dancer and like, Oh, should she do her dance performance? But she's been pushing herself really hard and she hurt her ankle. And you're just kind of like briefly in this completely different world. And then, and then like the story kind of, forces its way back in where it's like she keeps having nightmares of alternate realities and you're like oh god i can't escape it um and yeah so eventually you have to like you take her necklace and you go back and you you get into the door and then i mean i was popping off they have like (laughs) ascii art of the door to the writer's room opening and it's like you know written in i think of this as like in in old game facts guides you know, they would have, like, the, the art... Legend of Zelda thing drawn out in, like, you know, just keyboard symbols. And that's what this is. It's, it's ASCII art. And it was, like, the image of Alan in that room drawn out in these symbols, which is kind of 
like the purest form of what he is because he's literally just trapped their writing and now he's like made of writing. Oh, it was that's so a good sick. point. That's a good point. I was, yeah, I'm interested to hear that there was a whole different other little sub story because I just focused on Dor from the start and move through the story oh, that way. That's funny. Yeah, no, you you can like go and like live out a life with Jesse. <laughs> oh my god, see in mine I I I'm on the ground and I'm starving and then a version of me hands me a seed and then disappears and then I plant the seed, the tree grows, a, a fruit falls, I eat the oh, fruit wow. and then I hand the seed to somebody on the ground who is also me. So it like creates a loop within the Texas based adventure like that was me five minutes ago who got the seed from the me in the future. So they're trying to do the spiral loop thing again, like for fun. Um, and then that moves you forward to the end where I saw the same key art with like the, all the keyboard buttons to make that. And uh -huh. I was, I was like screeching the whole time. Like, this is so cool. I love, Oh my God. But that's fun that you like get to be with Jesse because remember in the web comic, he like says to her, he's like, are we like, have we, been together before or whatever yeah. and she's like oh what you're feeling is an echo which is a memory of another alternate universe so maybe that text-based adventure memory thing that you went through is the memory he was feeling when he was in the webcomic i think i think so yeah that's fun um yeah and so then that's that's basically where it ends right does yeah. anything happen after that um it, it just um, kind of ends there yeah, you go into a wormhole, and then there is, it does say, you know, in, in loving memory of oh, James that was McCaffrey, really nice. and it it just plays this, like, it, it, it's from, I think, the hotel level of Alan Wake 2, but is this great gravelly monologue of, like, you know, I was trapped in a spiral and all the people, and it's just, like, it's a really good mm -hmm. McCaffrey line delivery and I, I was I was really glad that they had had that tribute to him I'm so sad he passed away because he, this really feels like the precipice of him exploding into all kinds of different types of projects it's like he's he was so good in Alan Wake 2 and you know he has all this rich history with Remedy that was getting used so efficiently with his skills with voice acting not just in Max Payne but now as Alex Casey it's just such a sin because I really ugh just too bad yeah it it is it is a a true a true loss it's really sad mm -hmm. but oh my god just i love remedy so much and i'm so excited for the next dlc i think it's called the lake house if i'm not mistaken and I, i'm curious to yeah that one seemed even just if i had to go off the names of the two dlc this one kind of felt like have fun go ahead run around like enjoy yes. yourself and it kind of seems like the lake house might be like pay attention lore lore like this is gonna affect stuff sort of one that was my guess as well that it'll be more story focused maybe it'll be about like alice uh that'd more, be cool because alice is you know th there's a big twist with alice at the end of ellen wake too mm -hmm. um yeah i uh but like i this was you know, for for what this DLC was, it did exactly what I wanted, where yeah. it was just like a reminder of how much I liked Alan Wake 2 and them getting to <laughs> kind of flex their creative muscles and just be like, hey, we're we're having fun. But like no other studio is having fun like this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're not getting this from anywhere else. It was fun. It was fun for them to have a time frame limitation like that, like out an hour, 45 minutes to yeah. an hour, make a show because so much of the best that style of media like like you know like the twilight zone that's they were trying to encapsulate the what a mystery that gets delivered to you in 45 minutes feels like and that's a very we're used to that sort of feeling because up till now that's kind of how we received those sort of mystery weird you know like the song even is like a solar system in your soup like let's write a 45 minute episode if there was a solar system in someone's soup go like just do like yeah. those kind of thought experiments it's fun that now that's getting crunched onto them. Well, they're doing it to themselves, you know. It's like, we just want to release three rapid-fire <laughs> Twilight Zone episodes in our own world. Go for it. And they just clearly had so much fun with it. It was so good. And it's just making me have an Alan Wake hole in my heart even more right now, to be honest. That poor guy. He's just trapped down there. He's just waiting. He's just trapped. He had, like... 30 minutes where he got out and now I'm like two and <laughs> right yep. back. Poor guy. 
Well, thank you so much, Jacob, for chatting with me. That was super fun. We essentially just did a mini max spoilers, and I'll make that very abundantly clear in the episode when it's released. That I mean, yeah, hey, wait, we can we can cut it out. We can we can make this a max spoilers part two true. reusing content in a positive way very true i think and you're right we couldn't have just skipped how could we have skimmed the surface of that what would we have said no, there's no way like oh the third one when that happened whoa. I, I liked it it was good <laughs> when you know what happened that was crazy it's just impossible so yeah that warranted a better discussion um thanks everybody for listening um jacob anything to plug any anything to, you're in writing mode yeah. eh? Well, you know, listen to the Something Rotten podcast. Oh, yeah. um, uh, buy my book, uh, How a Game Lives. Uh, it'll <laughs> come out sometime this year. I'm not trapped in a lake house writing it. I'm actually living a <laughs> nice, normal life, but you should still buy it. You're the writer. Capital W, Jacob. The writer. <laughs> and check out all the upcoming... There'll be a lot of content this week, I'm, I'm guessing, with Ben and Charles and Janet. We're all in person at Summer Games Fest. As you heard when they <laughs> jumped in the call earlier today um so the episode this week coming up will just be breaking down all the stuff they got to actually play in person in california so that'll be cool to hear what what stuck out to them and stuff and i'm sure we'll be talking about all the other games that jumped out of the hundreds that were shown off this weekend so yeah thanks so much everybody and have a great rest of your day bye bye